All right. Um, so to kick things off, I'd like to introduce Jeff Hill, who is the head of the policy division here at the USA Bureau for Food Security. He'll just be giving a brief introduction and introducing our speakers. So Jeff. Thank you, Julie, and uh, thank uh, KDAD for actually hosting uh, this uh, set of uh, events here. It's actually really helpful to, I think, many different people. Uh, and I'm Jeff Hill with, as uh, Julie noted, with the uh, uh, policy team here in uh, the Bureau for Food Security. Uh, and I wanted to actually uh, welcome um, uh, her and Danielle here um, and and really introduce uh, them as well as our commentator. You know, Per, as I think you know, is a uh, um, uh, a famous fellow. Uh, he is uh, uh, currently uh, a professor emeritus of uh, food nutrition and, and uh, public policy at uh, Cornell, a former you know director general of IFPRI and um, and a, uh, a Nobel laureate uh, for uh, food uh, price there. The, and also currently the uh, chair of the uh, high-level panel uh, of experts um, on food uh, security. Uh, Danielle, you know, who is here with us, is uh, a, a research fellow at IFPRI uh, and is going to actually look a little bit beyond in you know, the 2007-2008 uh, uh, issues uh, that uh, Per will be, you know, giving us a recent um, um, a study from a recent uh, look at you know the uh, really what is how different countries have responded to the food uh, price uh, crisis that occurred and uh, some of the processes that they used and some of the decisions you know that they took in in response to that. But before they do that and before we actually get moving, I wanted to put in put in context a little bit you know of uh, this discussion and and uh, here inside of Feed the Future where we are actually giving a significant level of attention to policy, right, as an important um, part of uh, achieving our food security goals uh, that we've set out within the within uh, FTF. And within the policy, we are actually giving a lot of attention to what we're looking at as the institutional architecture, the, the part of the policy system, you know, that is, that is helping to actually understand uh, what you know is driving policy, and where are the you know where is the capacity, the systems that are enabling countries uh, to be able to deliver on their their goals um, and um, move this agenda forward. Um, and within <clears throat> all of that, we're trying to better understand how good and bad policies are made, and where a donor uh, and you know can actually provide some assistance with and make available some of the evidence that we're funding in, in uh, support of these different issues. Uh, I wanted to actually, before you know, handing over, just also introduce you know, our commentator, Lisa Williams, <clears throat> who is a senior governance fellow in the Center for Democracy, Rights, and Governance <clears throat> in uh, the Dacha Bureau. Lisa uh, has been leading the efforts within USAID uh, for greater attention to political economy analysis in, a, uh, in our programs and policy work in USAID. Uh, so with that, I think that we'll, you know, jump straight into it with Per, and uh, thank you very much. I think you are my pleasure. Right. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Jeff, for the kind words. No, I do not have a, a Nobel Prize. I do, <laughs> I do have the World Food Prize, and that is obviously as good or better. And that's a biased, that's a biased position. Thank you for inviting me to come back to AID. It is wonderful to see what uh, Feed the Future and other AID activities have done to the world uh, food, uh, agriculture, and environment uh, situation during the last few years. I'm old enough to remember the time when agricultural development, food security, uh, did not uh, receive a high priority uh, at AID, and I'm really pleased to see the tremendous change that has taken place and the very large number of highly qualified people who are now working uh, uh, at AID and in collaboration with AID to make the world a better place from the perspective of food security, nutrition, sustainability, and agricultural development. So thank you for inviting me uh, to speak to you today. Um, as I said in an earlier meeting this morning, I should be listening to you uh, from the Feed the Future rather than telling you because you have so much, um, you have so much uh, to talk about. 
In any case, um, we know quite a bit about how governments respond to food price volatility. When the food price fluctuates, uh, we know roughly how governments would respond, and if we don't know, we can find out. We, don't, we know very little about why governments respond the way they do. And there is uh, relatively little research that help us understand or better predict how governments would respond to the next, quote, food price crisis. Because as you uh, remember, I'm sure, in uh, the um, second half of 2007 and the first half of 2008, there were dramatic increases in food prices in the world market, and some of those price changes, price increases, were transmitted to, to um, developing country governments. And since then, we had dramatic um, uh, food price fluctuations. We are currently on a downward trend. We have been on a downward trend in so far as cereal prices are concerned, uh, at least for the last year. Uh, but it is, I presume, just a matter of time before we're going to have another price spike. Is that going to be next year or five years from now? Who knows? Much depends on weather and extreme weather events. So Fintarp, who is the Director General of WIDA, the United Nations uh, University's um, World Institute for um, uh, Development Economics Research, located in Helsinki, Finn and I got together and said, uh, why don't we see if we can improve the understanding of why governments responded the way they did to these food price fluctuations beginning in 07, and for that matter, are still going on. And so we approached the Gates Foundation, and uh, we got some funds from them, and we put in the rest of the money we needed from Cornell University, from WIDA, and from... <coughs> Uh, and from other, uh, I guess, basically those were, the, those were the funders that ended up paying for this research. Um, and this is shown, if I can uh, use this one, I can. Uh, here you see the 14 developing countries that we ended up working with. We have a research, uh, had a research in each of those 14 developing countries, uh, one in the EU and one in the U.S., uh, and that's the network that produced the um, output that I'm going to I'm going to talk about talk about today. So the first question was, okay, so food prices are increasing or fluctuating in the world market, but are these fluctuations really transmitted to developing countries? So that was kind of the first question we have to ask in order to uh, begin to study how governments would respond and why. And the answer, of course, depends <coughs> on the commodity you're looking at. <coughs> the commodity as well as the um, country. So I'm going to show you three illustrations. The first one has to do with wheat prices in South Africa and Bangladesh. The domestic prices in those two countries for wheat fluctuated roughly along with the world market price fluctuations. They are highly correlated, and the reason, of course, is that those two countries are closely integrated into the world market for wheat. Now, the next illustration shows, if you like, the opposite, where the domestic prices had really, uh, they were really not influenced by world market price fluctuations, and that's for rice in China and India. And the reason why those two countries basically kept their rice prices stable during a time when the world market rice prices fluctuated dramatically was that they wanted to protect the domestic market prices, and they did that by means of trade policy. In both cases, basically by export bans or export, export restrictions. The third illustration is from two landlocked countries, and that's Malawi and Zambia in this case, uh, which showed that the national factors causing price fluctuations in those domestic markets were much more important than the, the world market fluctuations. So you see virtually no correlation between what happened in those two markets and what happened in the in the uh, world market. So you, you, really have to, you really have to explain uh, which commodity, which country, which time period we're talking at 
talking about before you can say something about price uh, transmission. Now, if you want to have an average, and people like to have averages, in this case, it doesn't really mean much because of the large differences. But on the average, roughly one third of the fluctuations in the world market for food is, tra is transmitted to developing country food markets. But that's an average, as I said, that uh, <coughs> you can't really use for, use for much. We also wanted to see the extent to which the food prices in the European Union would be correlated with the food prices in the world market. And as you see on this slide, uh, there wasn't very much correlation. Well, a number of reasons for that. One being that the um, food, the international food price index that's shown uh, is weighted by the quantity of each food commodity that is traded internationally, whereas the weights for the EU price indices, of course, are very different. I want you to pay attention to what happened to consumer prices in the EU. Uh, I'm from the EU, and we complained a lot about these dramatic increases in food prices. Well, guess what? When they were the highest, it was like 5% increase as compared to two and, a, two and a half, three times increase in the international market, say for, say for rice. And of course, the reason there is that in the EU, what, what the consumer pays is to a very small extent due to the food. It's due to all the other things we add to the food. So all the complaints about the large price increases for food in the EU uh, basically came from the newspapers and the TV and not really from the, from the supermarket. I want to show you also another interesting finding. Um, let me see if I got uh, see if I got this one right. Yeah. Um, no, I want to I want to talk a couple of minutes about this one because if you now take a specific commodity or a set of commodities like cereals, grains in the EU, the prices in the EU for those commodities fluctuated roughly the same way as the world market because, because there was a, 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 a strong integration. So it depends again on which commodity and which country and which time period, which time period you're looking at. We also looked at the biofuel question because, as you know, there was a lot of discussion about the taking food and using it as a raw material for biofuel was a major factor in increasing food prices in 0708 <clears throat> and causing price fluctuations since then. This slide shows that there was virtually no correlation between the ethanol price, which increased and fluctuated, and the corn price or the maize price, which stays roughly, stayed roughly constant. Now, that was in, in 2006 or so. That changed dramatically in 2007 for two major, major reasons, uh, government subsidies for ethanol um, and um, the, the payoff from large investments in refineries for, for ethanol, ethanol production. So from that point on, from about mid-2007, you see a, a high correlation between the uh, world market food prices and the prices for, prices for ethanol. And there are estimates as to the importance of ethanol um, production or uh, biofuel production in general, because it includes both diesel and, and uh, ethanol, um, had an impact on, on food prices. And the estimates run from 10% to 30% of the fluctuation being caused by the ethanol, by the ethanol um, situation. So what were some of the policy responses? Well, there are basically two things that governments can do if they don't like the outcome of these price fluctuations. They can either try to decouple the price fluctuations in the world market from the domestic market prices, or they can let the international prices penetrate the domestic market and then compensate those groups that they don't want to see lose. Let me talk a little about the decoupling, the decoupling um, uh, policies. Um, trade policies. I already mentioned that for China and India, a number of other countries use trade policies to try to at least partially decouple the, uh, the prices. Direct price control. 
Uh, some countries uh, decreed that the food price shall be this, and of course it didn't work. It never does. Uh, you cannot decree what the price should be uh, unless you also adjust supply and demand to meet that new price. But a few countries tried. Some countries removed the value-added uh, tax on food uh, when prices were going up in order to protect the consumers. Uh, there were some short-term supply expansions. Uh, governments would release um, grain from the stocks that they controlled uh, when prices went up, and they would uh, procure uh, grain when prices went down. Some countries did the exact opposite, so that when prices were going up, they would procure more, which of course pushed the prices even higher, um, but um, so be it. Production expenses were not very important because, because we're really looking at short-term policies and uh, it's very difficult to expand production in, in the very short term unless you are a good friend of the weather gods. Uh, looking now to compensation, there were basically three things, uh, three ways. Um, I'm running behind here on my slide, for which I apologize. There were basically uh, three ways that the governments um, introduced compensation, uh, targeted cash transfers, uh, targeted or untargeted food subsidies, or increasing public sector wages. And I'm going to come back and talk about the targeting uh, issues a little later. But I want to move now to the policy process and the consequences. Most of the policy interventions were ad hoc. Uh, they were frequently late. A couple of governments kind of got ahead of themselves because they were told by the international news media that there was a problem with food prices. They, even though they didn't feel it in their own country, they sometimes took action that was not necessary. But in most cases, it was kind of panic, panic uh, food policy um, uh, interventions. The high costs meant that most of those policies didn't last very long. The government lost revenues uh, from export taxes, from removing uh, import tariffs, from removing the value added taxes, and of course the compensation programs, the um, Fertilizer subsidies, the uh, food subsidies, the cash transfers were very expensive, so it didn't last. It didn't last for very long. Um, the countries that inter interfered or intervened in the price signals, of course, didn't get the response that they were looking for. When prices went up, they would expect farmers to produce more, but if they stabilized prices, of course, that would not that would not happen. Um, I'm doing it again, and the reason I'm doing this is that I'm looking at a paper and I am forgetting that you are not seeing my paper, so I'm going to come down here and see if I can do this right. Otherwise, they will take my Nobel Prize away from me. So the policy, <laughs> the policy process consequences, poor targeting, some of that was intentional. The targeting was really not for the ultra-poor. It was for the lower middle class in the urban areas and to some extent poor people in the urban areas. Why? Because those were the groups that were threatening government legitimacy, even though those were not the groups uh, that were suffering the most because many of the rural poor were net buyers of food and of course when prices would go up, uh, they would suffer, they would suffer as well. Food and uh, fertilizer subsidies, they were short term because they were very expensive. Uh, Malawi is an illustration of uh, fertilizer subsidies that lasted for a long time, but even Malawi had to kind of give in to the high costs. We didn't get very much on corruption because it's very sensitive. If you are a researcher in your own country and you're going to talk about the government's corruption, uh, you may have to come and work in Washington. And some of them wanted to stay in their countries, so we didn't get very much on that. We do have some indications. Uh, of corruption in various in various places. The trade policies uh, were less effective in some countries because of the informal cross-border cross border trading um, and the export bans were selectively enforced by some countries. Uh, we will export 
for our friends, but we have an export ban for everybody else, that kind of thing. We saw some of that, particularly for India. <coughs> I already mentioned uh, untimely government uh, procurement. Uh, sometimes government would procure when the prices were already going up. Uh, not, uh, not a good idea if you want to stabilize prices. Political economy issues or lessons. Most of the countries had it as their goal to improve or protect food security. But virtually all countries had a goal that superseded that goal, which was government legitimacy. So if there was a trade-off between improving food security and protecting the government legitimacy, the latter would win out in every country. No big surprise, we should expect that. Uh, but we have clear evidence of that. The, the government policies paid very little attention to what would happen to the rest of the world. The beggar than neighbor kind of policies were very common. And this goes back, for example, to the export bans. The export bans pushed the prices up for the rest of the world with all of the negative consequences that came. So we really need some international action in order uh, to assure some reasonable behavior by exporters, and I'm coming back to that in a minute. Unitary government decision making is very unusual. There's a lot of conflict, a lot of contradictions, uh, a lot of discussion as to what each unit within each government wanted to happen. And again, if we go into a country thinking that somehow uh, everybody agrees that we should, they should pursue this policy, we're missing something very important. There's a lot of interaction, a lot of conflict going on uh, before the policies are finally, are finally made. In most cases, uh, th there wasn't really any policy innovation. Uh, countries pursued whatever new policies they came up with were very similar to the ones they had been pursuing in the past when they had food price fluctuations. And the relative power of stakeholder groups varied a great deal. Smallholder farmers had absolutely no impact on what policies were designed and implemented as far as we can tell in those 14 countries. In two countries, the large farmers through their associations did have quite a bit of impact. That was Brazil and, and South Africa. Uh, consumers, of course, had a great deal of impact because of the threat uh, to the government, to the government legitimacy. A threat: We're going to go and we're going to go and, and riot. There are all kinds of reasons why you want to make your your uh, key um, supporters happy. Political uh, economy lessons, uh, more of those. Increasing urban bias, the, the policy interventions when these food prices fluctuated, the policy interventions were really focused on the urban area. No big surprise, we see urban, urban bias in a lot of policies, but it was very clear in this set of studies. Smallholders versus larger farms, as I mentioned, uh, there was a lot of talk about helping smallholder farmers, uh, but it was mostly rhetoric. There was a tremendous mistrust between government and the private sector. The government would hold back on a new decree or a new policy or a new law until the last minute. So the private sector wouldn't have opportunity for <coughs> adjusting to it. And the, and the public sector, sorry, and the private sector, of course, would uh, not tell the government what it was do it, uh, doing in terms of hoarding food or whatever they were doing if they could avoid it. Um, one of the interesting things which I did not expect uh, because I, I used to do research in a structural adjustment um, business that uh, is now, I guess, still going on in a few places. There was a period of time when that's all we talked about, where the international agencies had a lot of impact on what national governments ended up doing, for obvious reasons. There was money involved. Um, we, in all of these 14 countries, we saw virtually no impact by international agencies to do something different from what the governments were doing. And I thought that was an, in, I, I can't explain that, I don't know why that is, uh, but it appears as though the international community was supporting whatever the governments wanted to do. Uh, presumably that's a good thing. So what are the lessons for policy, uh, for policy assistance, say from outside? 
Do not assume unitary government decision-making processes because if you do, you're missing something very important and you may end up with policy interventions that were unexpected. <clears throat> Expect a strong urban bias. Yes, I guess we do this already. Expect a strong bias in favor of large-scale farmers. There is a huge difference between the rhetoric and the action, as I already mentioned. The evidence based for policy decisions is weak. This is one of the areas that if we really want the public sector in low-income developing countries particularly <coughs> to make evidence-based policy decisions, they need to strengthen the evidence base and we can help them from, from outside. That's different from telling them what to do. It's simply saying, here's a way by which you can make uh, the decisions that you want based on the evidence that is available. I already talked about the mutual distrust between the public and the private sector. This is something we have to take into account as we talk about public-private partnerships. <clears throat> Let me finish with the recommendations. Price signals are important. If prices go up, you would hope that farmers would produce more. And you would hope consumers would consume less. Prices go down, you hope the opposite would be the case. Governments that try to stabilize prices beyond one cropping season won't get those signals. And they will get themselves in trouble because the supply and demand won't adjust. Now, this sounds like a new classical economics argument, and it is but prices do have a role to play. If you're talking about one growing season, one agricultural season, yes, price stabilization may make sense. And related to that, it is more likely that governments would be successful if they focus on targeted compensation rather than uh, price uh, intervening in the price signal. And the two are, are closely related. We need risk management tools for all system agents, and that goes for the traders as well as the farmers and the consumers. The trade, the um, um, risk management tools uh, that are currently available in many countries are grossly insufficient. And that, of course, includes um, better weather forecasting, includes access to credit, it includes a number of things uh, that we can certainly talk about if you like. And related to my question and my comment on price signals, we need a higher level of price transmission so that, in fact, producers in one country can respond to what's happening in other countries and international levels. And as part of that, we need lower levels of trade, trade restrictions. Now, just to be absolutely clear, uh, I didn't dream these up, this up before the study, uh, saying um, whatever the study shows, that's what I'm going to recommend. It actually came out of the work. We need to increase the supply elasticities for food so farmers can respond to price changes. And that means investments in infrastructure, <coughs> investment in, in uh, local markets, investment in the supply chain in general, so that, in fact, the system can work, so the farmers can get access to reasonably priced inputs and can sell <coughs> his or her output at reasonable prices as well. We need improved management of cereal stocks so that countries don't procure cereals when the cereal prices are skyrocketing because that would have the exact opposite effect. Of, and that probably means taking the management of cereal uh, stocks out of the political sphere which is something that may be extremely difficult. Uh, the rules can be set by the politicians, but the implementation, it seems to me, should be done by, by technicians. The blending requirements that we have in this country is price insensitive. You have to blend your gasoline with whatever it is, 10% or whatever it may end up being, irrespective of what the price of corn and if we're talking about diesel, soybeans, and so on. It, that contribute to price fluctuations for food because you're taking a quantity out no matter what the price is. If, on the other hand, we were to make the blending requirement price sensitive, we would, that would be one way of 
reducing the price fluctuations. Is that politically possible? I don't know. We need to strengthen the international agreement regarding exporter behavior. I already referred to the export bans when, 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 when the rice prices were about two and a half to three times higher than they were eight months before. We had more rice in the world than we ever had. It wasn't because there was a lack of supply of rice globally. It was because of the policies that were put, that were put in place. And some of those policies were put in place by traditional exporters, not just India. I didn't mean to just pick on one country. <coughs> Vietnam, Myanmar, there were a number of countries, Egypt. They basically restricted exports, and because of that, the international rice price increased dramatically. WTO does have um, uh, something written down that the exporters should behave, but they're not really binding, so a lot more work is needed if we are to get the exporters to behave a little better next time we have a price spike. And then we need to improve the public-private uh, collaboration. I have referred to that a couple of times. Here are some of the sources. Um, there is a book uh, just out uh, on, the, uh, on the wider series on Oxford University Press, and then the wider website, which you can see here, uh, has uh, all of the information as well, free of charge, open access. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much for the opportunity to, to speak with all of you this morning, and especially um, to speak uh, after such a, a distinguished uh, uh, speaker and researcher as Pear. Um, I wanted to share with you this morning some ongoing research um, that the International Food Policy Research Institute is doing in conjunction with Michigan State University and University of Pretoria uh, with the support of USAID via Feed the Future and, and the Food Security Project. Um, and really through this tripartite effort, what we're trying to do is provide um, a useful practical analytical tool um, for understanding what drives policy change, um, and particularly in policy arenas that are relevant for food security issues, such as agriculture and, nutri and nutrition. Um, and we're hoping um, such a tool, which we're calling the kaleidoscope model, um, will be useful for both explaining past episodes of policy change, like uh, the food price crisis, but also be a little bit predictive and, and help identify uh, when and how and, and, and how policy change uh, might manifest in the future and the kind of design of, of that particular policy. Um, so the motivations for this work are really from the drive that we're seeing throughout the development community uh, for the past couple of years on trying to have policy impact, right? Everyone uh, wants to have some type of impact, whether it's donors wanting to have value for money or the research community wanting to have some uptake of research findings. Um, but I think there's a real increasing awareness that you can't really have policy impact unless you really understand the underlying policy process. Um, and in our work, we're just kind of focusing on the national government policy process. That's kind of the scope condition of our work. Um, and so understanding, you know, is a lack of a policy change due to a lack of political will, or is it due to a lack of implementation capacity? Um, we really need more kind of fine-grained understandings of, of how policies are made to understand where we can, we can best intervene. And I think we're seeing that awareness is becoming very clear um, in the research community. Um, Pear's work and the work that you and you wider have been doing on the food price crisis is a great example of that. Um, also, um, the UK-based Future Agricultural Consortium has been doing a lot of work on, on policy process related to agriculture. In the nutrition community, a lot of initiatives such as Transform Nutrition, um, which is looking at the politics of nutrition policy. There's the scaling up nutrition work of the UN. In the land domain, the World Bank's land governance assessment frameworks are trying to understand how policy process is made in that, in that domain. And the African Union has, has its own land policy initiative. So we're seeing across different kind of food security domains um, an increasing interest uh, by both practitioners and researchers to better understand you know, what are the processes underlying um, policy. And so we felt that USAID's uh, food security project really offers a great opportunity to both build on a lot of this existing work, um, but to try to consolidate it in some way um, and see what some of the main messages are coming out of this work and um, other uh, episodes of policy change research. 
So the objectives of this work were fourfold. Um, one I've already mentioned is that we want to have something that's practical, um, but that also that's rigorous and, and empirically informed. Um, and a tool that's flexible enough to be useful across different country settings. So whether you're talking about a democratic or authoritarian setting, a presidential or parliamentary regime, resource rich or resource poor context. So some, something that's not um, just limited to a particular set of country um, characteristics. Secondly, we want it to be a little bit more interdisciplinary. Um, you know, there's been a lot of work in the public administration field for decades on policy process. Um, and some of those insights are still relevant um, to, to food security policy processes, but also linking more with the political science and economics work as well. We wanted the framework thoroughly to be testable so that we can have hypotheses and we can, we can either validate or uh, you know, falsify our framework um, in a way that also looks at the, the different elements of the policy process. So understanding why something gets on the agenda in the first place or why a particular policy design is adopted or I think the case we're most familiar with are why policies are adopted but then never implemented. Um, and to also be able to investigate some of the implicit uh, hypotheses that I think are out there in the development community about how you get policy change. Um, you know, some believe that it's about getting high-level commitments. So if you get the G8, if you get the African Union um, to get on board with something, then you can you can get this on the policy agenda. Uh, researchers like to think if you have rigorous quality evidence, then you can get um, uh, an issue on the policy agenda. Um, others think if you're targeting policy champions, then you can have select stakeholders who can push policy forward. And fourthly, uh, we'd like to kind of better integrate these diverse communities, whether in nutrition, land, agriculture communities, who are kind of working in parallel a little bit, um, but I think are finding some similar um, findings from their work. So our approach was relatively um, straightforward. It involved being a bit inductive and actually drawing on um, a large number of case studies of policy change out there, including a lot of the case studies um, from Pear's work. Um, but also more broadly on, on social protection, uh, health, education, um, agriculture, um, you know, identifying consistent variables that are um, consistently coming across as being important for policy change. Um, and trying to narrow down to what we call macro variables. Of course, there's many, many things that contribute to policy change, but what are consistently the ones that seem to be the overarching factors across uh, different cases that are important for policy change or the lack of policy change? Um, and in doing this, we wanted to give a lot of attention to necessary and sufficient conditions. Um, you know, what, what do you need um, not just to get you know, a policy issue on the agenda, um, but to actually, uh, you know, get it pushed forward to the design uh, stage or to adoption stage. So we've labeled um, our model um, the kaleidoscope model. Um, a few reasons for this. One is just kind of the image um, that we wound up coming, coming up with to express this. Um, and the image is, has these three levels to it. On the outside, we've taken the typical kind of public administration approach to policy process, which, which talks about you have these various elements, you have agenda setting, you have design, you have adoption, um, you have implementation, and then evaluation and reform. Um, and we really we realize this is not kind of linear process, it's endogenous, there's lots of feedback linkages. Um, but you know it's kind of a it's a useful tool to um, to kind of uh, disaggregate what are the most important variables at a particular element of the policy process. The middle level here um, or I guess the innermost kind of circular level there is the kind of crux of, of the work that we're doing. Um, these are kind of the macro variables that we're talking about, trying to come up with a parsimonious two or three main factors that seem to be necessary and sufficient conditions for getting something onto the agenda or getting it, um, getting it adopted, uh, getting it implemented. Um, and then this, this middle level out here is just really kind of a non-exhaustive list of the many you know, secondary variables that influence um, these macro variables. But our real, real concern is with these, these macro variables, which give us a more parsimonious um, approach to understanding policy change. And so we're hoping that with this approach, you can, you can explain why small changes accumulate and lead to policy change in some, some countries or in some policy domains, um, but not in others. Um, and we're calling it the kaleidoscope model mostly because uh, 
you know, just like with a kaleidoscope, when you shift it and light kind of refracts, it, it shows kind of a different constellation of, of shapes and patterns. And similarly here, when you're kind of shifting what your research question or your policy question is, uh, you kind of see a different constellation of, of variables that seem to be more or less predominant. So it might just be useful to give an example of, of how this would apply. Um, and I'm just going to do this very briefly in the interest of time. Um, but thought about using Ghana's fertilizer subsidy program. Um, <clears throat> you know, Ghana is one of the around 10 African countries that adopted a fertilizer subsidy program. Um, but it's really, I mean, even today, I think if is presenting to the, the Ministry of Agriculture um, some policy prescriptions about what they can do to, to reform this program because um, the government realizes, as, as Per alluded to, that this is uh, fiscally unsustainable. So if we were just taking kind of a slice of the kaleidoscope, um, we can take this element of agenda setting. So trying to understand how did, how did this issue even get on the agenda? Um, you know, a lot of countries were part of the Abuja Declaration. Only about 10 African countries actually have chosen fertilizer subsidies to increase uh, fertilizer use. So um, we've focused the, the agenda setting element of our model um, really distills three factors that seem to be kind of necessary and sufficient conditions. One is some type of focusing event. This can be a short-term crisis, like a food food price crisis, um, but it could be something, it could be a high-level declaration, like the Abuja Declaration, um, or it could be kind of um, you know, a long-term initiative in the policy community, community like the scaling up nutrition in the, in the nutrition domain. In the Ghanaian case, um, the focusing event was the food price crisis in 2008. And specifically, the timing of that crisis being so near the next presidential elections. Um, so the, the ruling party at the time, the NPP, really feeling that um, it, could be, it could be a real liability if it wasn't seen to be acting quickly um, to uh, react to the food price crisis. But you also need kind of a strong advocacy coalition, right? You need uh, policy champions who are out there pushing for some policy uh, to go forward. Um, in this case, um, you had many different uh, policy champions, but the most important was the president, um, President Kufor, who actually made um, a high-level announcement in, in 2008 that they were going to proceed um, with this fertilizer program, um, apparently without the Ministry of Finance being informed in advance uh, that they were going to do this. And then thirdly, um, you need a relevant, it needs to be a relevant problem. This might seem a little bit redundant, but actually um, you need to have something that's not just uh, a president's pet project, for example. You need something that's resonating um, with the broader um, uh, community. Um, and so in the Ghanaian case, uh, Ghana is one of the lowest users of fertilizer, um, only about eight kilograms um, per hectare in sub-Saharan Africa. So um, it was seen as really, you know, doing something to increase soil fertility um, was, was key. I'm not going to get through all the details on, on Ghana for the design element, but um, we just highlight what the three elements are that we see as being important um, in understanding why a particular design is chosen. So if we take fertilizer subsidies across the 10 or so countries, they've all chosen a little bit of a different program, a little bit of a different design. Um, and so to understand why, we've seen kind of three factors being key. Um, one is what type of, what type of problem brought um, brought the issue onto the agenda in the first place. Was it a crisis, a pressing problem, or was it kind of a chosen problem? Um, so a lot of times in the, in the, in the nutrition domain, um, you know, it's, it's hard to see kind of the immediate damage from malnutrition, but you need to kind of have sustained commitment over time um, to addressing malnutrition, and that seemed to be more of a chosen problem. The reason this is important is because sometimes if you have a pressing program, a problem or a crisis, governments quickly need to react, right? And they choose something that's maybe off the shelf, um, something that's going to be highly visible and get them a big payoff. Um, ideas and beliefs also play a key part if this is coming from the research community, the donor community. Um, but giving some ideas about what would be the best design uh, for a program given the country's circumstances. And then cost-benefit calculations, not just financial costs, but also maybe the political cost um, that someone that a government gets um, for the design that it takes. And then um, you just took one final slice of this, uh, the evaluation and reform you know, element of, of uh, the policy process. Um, in, this, um, in this element of the policy process, we 
we really saw two kind of key um, macro variables coming across, um, which is kind of changing beliefs of veto players and policy champions. So veto players are those individuals who have the ability to change things. The, the main decision makers, whether it's parliamentarians, ministers, uh, the president, um, and policy champions, which might be veto players, but they, they might just be kind of stakeholders in the community um, who are pushing the policy forward. So we often see that the beliefs of these actors um, changes in, in what they feel, whether the approach is working or not, um, starts the reform process going. So in the Ghanaian case, um, you know, they started with a voucher program for fertilizer subsidies. They moved to a way bill program. Um, but some of the more kind of credible um, kind of international and research organizations looking at the subsidy issue in, in Ghana have increasingly found that even this way bill system is administratively cumbersome, um, and the most vulnerable farmers are not benefiting from it. Um, and importantly, the Ministry of Finance is believed to uh, oppose the FSP. Um, so that's that's one of the most important veto players that you need on your on your side. And the second main macro variable for understanding when you get evaluation and reform um, is basically a kind of a cost benefit analysis. Uh, you know, available resources relative to the cost of the program. Um, and uh, with Ghana, falling commodity prices, particularly for for oil and cocoa, plus a high public sector wage bill, um, has really increased the public debt there. And they're now negotiating with the IMF. Um, and fertilizer companies, you know, are owed about um, 60 million uh, Ghanaian CDs and back payments, about 20 million U.S. dollars. Um, so of course, they're not um, a huge a huge fan of the program. So um, that was just you know talking about the Ghanaian subsidies, uh, just to kind of give you an example of the uh, empirical application. Um, but what we're hoping in the next year or so to do is to um, look across three domains, three policy domains um, that link up nicely with some of the feed the future priorities. So um, in addition to fertilizer subsidies, also looking at micronutrient interventions um, and land tenure reforms. Um, and we think it's this is kind of a nice set of um, policy issues because they have a, um, different levels of variation across them. Um, first, in terms of the policy type, so kind of fertilizer subsidies and micronutrient interventions are, are seen as distributive policies, kind of allocation of new resources um, to distinct um, groups, stakeholder groups. Um, land tenure reform is seen as a redistributive policy, um, so maybe reallocating existing resources or codifying land rights in a way that, that might have implications for reallocating um, investment and resources. Um, they're a little bit different in terms of the focusing events and whether they're kind of seen as pressing or chosen problems. So um, kind of the, the impetus for a lot of the fertilizer subsidies and land tenure reforms has come from, from food and fuel crises and issues around land grabs. Um, but a lot of the micronutrient work that's going on, vitamin A fortification, um, iron fortification, has really been more of a chosen problem and it's been pushed um, kind of over the long term um, through high level initiatives and, and key people in the public health community. Thirdly, um, as you, many of you might be aware that fertilizer subsidies are kind of labeled as wicked as a wicked problem um, because there's so many different ways you can you can look at this issue. Um, maybe they're not you know reducing poverty, but maybe they're increasing yields. Maybe they're increasing yields, but they're crowding out the private sector. Um, and so whether whether the donor community and the research community um, believes in supporting fertilizer subsidies really believes on what kind of normative outcome um, is thought to be best. And so we see a lot more division, I think, um, in the research and policy community on those than we see on the importance of micronutrient interventions or having secure land tenure um, rights. Um, and then if I just skip to the primary stakeholders, I mean, the, the important thing to just note about this last column is that um, some of these domains involve a lot more interministerial cooperation, particularly nutrition policy um, than ag subsidies, for example. So we think that by kind of looking at um, these three different policy domains, we get more leverage on the utility of our framework if it can explain policy change um, despite all the differentiation in these different domains. Okay, so I'll just conclude with um, a few contributions. Um, 
So we think this model is quite useful for actually being operationalized. Um, and if you go to, I should have put the site here, but if you go to IFPRI's website, the discussion paper series, um, in our discussion paper where we present the model, we go through how you can operationalize uh, changing beliefs or you know, who are the veto players um, and a lot of the other macro variables that are put in the model. And it can have strong potential for control and comparative analysis. So looking across, for example, different policy domains within the same country, um, or looking across the same policy domain in, in different countries. And I think finally it's um, a way to start just thinking of political economy being about interest groups and material interests. Um, interest groups are important, but we know ideas also play, I believe, normative ideas and beliefs. Um, and epistemic communities play a role. And then institutions are kind of political and economic institutions that kind of limit the scope um, for reform. So we're hoping the model is able to integrate um, ideas, interests, and institutions simultaneously, and uh, more so than existing public administration work, um, look at the relative weight of domestic and external actors, including um, us in, in the international research and donor community. So I will, I will leave it there, and I welcome feedback. An hour for questions and comments. And uh, to kick things off, we I just want to introduce Lisa Williams again, who is with the USA Bureau for Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Affairs, and the Senior Government Fellow. So Lisa will give our first comments, and then we'll switch back and forth between our webinar audience and our in-person audience uh, to take questions and comments. Lisa? Thank you very much. Um, just to say, first of all, thank you. It's really an honor to be here with you, Pear, and with you, Danielle. Um, this is very exciting to, to us uh, in USAID and in the Democracy Rights and Governance Office. Particularly, last week we launched um, a new action plan that was signed by the administrator to integrate governance and rights and democracy issues more effectively across sectors. So I think here we are um, discussing just that. And one of the major levers for doing so we see is political economy analysis and really trying to, to give officers within the agency a way to more effectively analyze what's happening in terms of questions like political will, which both of you raised. Um, I just wanted to, to raise a couple of things. I would say, you know, in, in our efforts, um, we've realized that the success or failure of development programs is largely determined by the domestic politics within aid recipient countries. And there is a tendency today with um, the changing role of foreign assistance for there to be a larger reliance on what's happening in the wider community. Because as Per rightly pointed out, um, it's important for us to realize that the aid agency isn't always the one that's making the largest change in a particular context. Um, I think that the one of the key things, too, that I heard Per say particularly, as he went through the price fluctuations related to rice, maize, and wheat, each time he discussed those price changes, he had to contextualize heavily and reinforce the notion that it's important to understand what exactly is happening in the context for each one of those types of fluctuations. So all the more coming back to this idea that development agencies need to be thinking about how it is that they fit within a wider context. Um, also in the spirit of Paris, uh, and Busan, and our commitments to support other countries to, to pursue their own development objectives. Um, the one thing that I found interesting in this is that at the root of political economy analysis, which has been used in various forms by this development agency and many others, um, is the drivers of change sort of frame, uh, particularly that was developed at, at the Department for International Development of the UK. And um, I think that it's very uh, nice the way that you've developed this kaleidoscope to bring together that, that type of approach. And it's very much a, a politically aware um, framing, I think. Um, my major question, I think, to uh, Pear really is, at one point during your presentation, you made a very interesting comment that perhaps because of all of the fluctuations and the, the inability to always understand why governments respond the way they do and our inability to affect that, maybe we should try to separate the technical from the political in some sense. And I just wanted to ask you, and I think others may ask similar questions, how, how do you see that kind of thing really playing out? Because We've worked a little bit also on connecting inclusive growth diagnostics and political economy questions and analyses. And we're not certain you know, how it is that those things interact at which time is most appropriate and how, how you protect the politics from the technical. Because I think many, um, many agencies are now working in the direction of trying to bring the two together. 
to address more effectively what's happening in terms of political will. Um, I think that's that's all for now. Just to, to um, say a little bit about what we are doing. Um, there's been a framework developed to help officers within USAID to look at the country level, sector level, or problem level of political economy questions within their own programming and to try to think really principally about how their programs might be changed over time um, in an awareness of the political environment and, and the economic context like price fluctuations or, or other questions. So um, this kind of uh, framework that we're developing is really more about making sure that programming is more context sensitive and much more aware of what's happening uh, in country and giving officers space to actually respond and change their programming working uh, to the context over time. So um, this could be conflict affected countries or, or in more stable and middle income countries where we're looking for sustainability. But again, back to integrating uh, democracy rights and governance uh, across sectors and working more effectively on questions like policy change. Thank you. What did you want to respond to? Um, sure. Very, very briefly, since I took too much time uh, in my first go around. Um, what, what I was referring to specifically was management of grain reserves. But, but you can use that uh, example in so many other contexts. Politicians should set the rules and then get out of the way when the implementation is to take place. Because the technicians are those who are trained to to do the impl implementation can probably do that in a less political environment. Now, is that is that uh, is the is is the policymaker likely to give up uh, that power which is involved in changing the implementation after the, uh, the design has been uh, made? Probably not. But but it it came it came through loud and clear in the case of um, procurement or release of grain for the. Uh, for the uh, government controlled stocks, uh, that it was so political that it frequently ended up being done uh, in the, at the wrong time, even even to meet the goals of the politicians themselves, because of, of what Danielle was talking about, the, the interplay within the government. And, and we must not forget that uh, what, I, what I was trying to say, that the, the government doesn't operate as a unitary decision-making process. There's a, there's that process within government is extremely important, and we need to understand it much better than we do. We may not have to, um, we may not have to say this is this is right and this is wrong, but we need to understand how it works. Uh, can I say one other thing? That we need more uh, governments need more evidence about consequences of alternative policies. This is something that IFPRI and Feed the Future and many others have been working on, WIDA and Cornell and so on. We need a lot more of practical policy relevant evidence for governments to understand the consequences for the various stakeholder groups as well as for the economy as a whole of various policies. And technicians can play a tremendous role, important role in that. Uh, we'll take a question from our online audience and then come back to in-person. Okay, great. We have about 90 people still joining us online. And there's been a lot of online discussion about export bans. And Christine Negra of Eco Agriculture Partners says, the export bans were widely criticized. It'd be interesting to hear the speaker's assessment of this tactic. Also, what disincentives do exporting countries have to not implement an export ban in response to domestic pressures? Export bans uh, did a tremendous harm to the uh, international, to the world, to the world market for grain. Uh, it is uh, very much a beggar the neighbor kind of uh, approach, where you're protecting your own at the expense of, of others. Uh, I believe the only there's really no strong incentive for a government not to do that. Uh, unless the government enters into international agreements. And that is one of the reasons we have something called the World, uh, the World Trade Organization. They just have not been able to get a handle on the export side uh, of, the, of, these, uh, of these issues. That's extremely important that much more negotiation takes place uh, in WTO before the next crisis hit us. Come to our in-person audience, and uh, please state your name and organization. Also. Tom Timberg, myself, uh, 
very interesting set of two presentations, but the context is, uh, I, this happened to me this weekend, Catherine Kelly on the club that controls the world, you the, the commodity, commodity trade. And commodity trade, the international commodity traders, um, and certainly in this country, as far as trade policy is concerned for agricultural <coughs> commodities, their role has been very important. And for USAID, which has major involvements with a number of the uh, of the commodity traders on a country by country basis, the question is when you talk about public private involvement, international organizations, etc., whether some explicit involvement with the large commodity traders is perhaps not called is perhaps not, not called for? In other words, should USAID, which is spending millions of dollars with Olam and so forth, big traders, what about going to them in Singapore and sitting down with them and developing a an international um, uh, strategy that doesn't involve just supporting them in this country and supporting them in that country and supporting them in this country, but coordinating with them uh, to deal with the overall problems of world food supply. I think that would be wonderful as long as you don't diminish the competition because there is competition among these large uh, commodity traders and if what you're suggesting is that AID should go in and create a monopoly, no, I'm opposed to that. You presumably are not saying that. But yes, interaction with these large commodity traders, absolutely, very important. I would agree. You want to add anything? <laughs> no. We'll go back to our online audience. David Sirocco from Crown Agents Weidemann asks, with countries like Saudi Arabia abandoning wheat production and building strategic reserves, and with countries such as China, India, South Korea, and others buying LDC land to produce food for export to their own consumers, how do we rationalize LDC governments not intervening in their food markets? Well, Saudi Arabia stopped producing wheat as far as I know. Uh, it was a little too expensive even for Saudi Arabia. Do you want to add anything else? Huh? <laughs> it gets us into land grabbing. It gets us into what does a country do to assure itself of uh, the future uh, food supplies that it needs without uh, participating in the international trade. And one way, of course, is to try to buy or get control of land in other countries. But that wasn't the question you're asking. But I think it's part of that. It's part of that uh, same question. Uh, Self-sufficiency is important to those countries who do not trust the international trading community. Uh, and even Saudi Arabia at one point in time produced wheat at, at uh, production costs that were extremely high. As far as I know, they don't do it anymore. Hmm. Hi there. Can you hear me? I am Angie Steen, I'm with Futures Group. Thanks so much for this really interesting conversation. Um, this conversation has called for more evidence to um, allow policymakers to make more informed decisions. Um, but and also that echoes what if we, if we had a lecture, a really good one about a month ago, where it was looking at the nutrition space. And, and that too was calling for more evidence so that governments would know policy responses for key nutrition interventions. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious to know if you could, could talk a little bit more about the kind of evidence and also is some of that cost work in costing. So for example, in the health sector, we cost different key nutrition interventions. But that's a little maybe a little easier to do because some of those are isolated. We know how much vitamin A costs, we know how much iron folate supplementation costs, and calcium. But what about in the egg space? Are there any Organizations, does IFPRI, FAO, do they cost different types of agricultural interventions or even um, um, crop insurance? Are the, is that data available? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I could I could start out with that. Um, I mean, on the, your first point about um, what type of additional evidence, I mean, I think um, in some regards, particularly on, on policy process issues, I think there's a lot of evidence that's out there now. And then I think on top we have, you know, there's about 27 donor efforts to also have a political economy framework. So I think um, we're maybe kind of all kind of doing things in parallel. Um, and, and, and one of our efforts here is to try to take stock of what's actually been done and start consolidating what some of these, these key findings are. Um, and so I think, you know, our, our nutrition uh, people at IFBRI have 
you know, done great stuff with the Lancet special issues and what's driving the politics of nutrition policy. Um, but a lot of those factors they identify are not very different from what you would find in social protection, which which driven social protection policies or which driven agricultural policy decisions. Um, so um, I think on policy process, I think we actually there's a lot out there, and it's more about consolidation. Um, in terms of what IFPRI's done on costings, I mean, yeah, there has been work on. Um, We've had in the past a very strong kind of public investment um, research agenda on costing, uh, you know, where governments should be, you know, given limited resources, what should governments be prioritizing, and particularly um, our, our current DG, Schengen Fan, has looked a lot at infrastructure investments and what type of roads you should be investing in. Um, and I know that our, our markets group has been looking at different types of insurance, disaster insurance, crop insurance um, policies that are out there. So. Um, there have been attempts to do the costing. I don't. I don't think that it's um, you know a clear, accessible database. Uh, we do have a, a public expenditure database that you can look at, but um, you know a lot of it's kind of buried in in discussion papers and reports. Can I just add to that? That and I agree with. What, can I just add to that that we desperately need much more, a much better understanding of how to change the food system for the benefit of nutrition and health. And this is an area that a lot of people talk about right now. Uh, Feed the Future is involved in, in work in, in this area. We need to strengthen that at the field level so that we really get an understanding of how can governments and the private sector change the food system for the benefit of what we all want, namely good health and good nutrition for all. Uh, and, and there we are very short on evidence. And we tell governments, uh, to change the food system for the benefit of health, but we don't tell them how to do it. Question from our online audience. Yes, Robert Navin, who's an independent food and trade advisor to USAID, says West Africa has plans to coordinate a food reserve to stabilize prices. Any commentary on how this is going and what should be done? I don't know about that, so if you know. Um, it's a very tricky question because food reserves, uh, in, in the sense of, um, of uh, filling the warehouses with, uh, say, grain uh, for a rainy day kind of thing, or for a day when it doesn't rain, which is probably more relevant, uh, can be extremely expensive. Uh, and so some small food reserves, yes, absolutely, particularly in landlocked countries. But depending on the international trade trading system is much less expensive and probably as efficient. India right now has, as far as I know, 80 million tons of grain in stock, and a lot of it is not on the roof. It is rotting at a very rapid rate. It's very expensive to keep large reserves of food. So some reserves, particularly where trade uh, doesn't isn't efficient. Yes, absolutely. But in most cases, I would depend on international trade rather than large reserves. Uh, my name is Ryan from Institute of Agricultural Marketing, basically headquartered from India, and we have an office in New York. The question here is the price and the price fluctuations. The price will be fixed based on the cost of cultivation, but not by the market is as because the farmer has to get into things. And the question of the exports, if I am importing some product from some other countries where my my own farmers are producing it, where the price is fluctuating like a lower price and then I'm getting it at a higher price, how can I sell in my market? Or uh, if I am getting it at a lower price from the imported imported product and then my farmer's prices uh, you know, the comparatively a higher price, and how can I save my farm from price fluctuations? As per the agri business concerns, the, the price is fixed based on the centralized policy and it should be implemented decentralized manner in the Asian, South Asian countries. How can you address if it is centralized or decentralized? For both of you. Thank you. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure if you're referring to the beggar thy neighbor kind of policies where a country is putting an export ban on uh, its export, which would push up international prices, and how can you deal with that? Is, is that what you're asking, or maybe I don't understand? Yes, yes. If yeah. suppose my farmer is right. producing a price, sure. which is $3, yeah. 
So where I am importing from in order states, it should be a two dollar by the time when I get it in my market. Right. So how can I save my farmer's price? Or the farmer, how can I save? Do you think that I oh, have I paying compensation? I, do I you see. think that I have to stop the subsidies of the fertilizers? Or do you think that I can afford that in such a situations? Do I do you think that my policy should be decentralized or centralized? If I decentralize as a political man. So what is my fate of my party? Well, and 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 these concerns, can we think? Because the food is the major factor for the uh, for the developing country or developed country. Yeah, now I understand. That's the, what I'm asking. I understand the question, and and of course it is context specific. It depends on the context within which the question is is asked. But generally speaking, there are two two things that I would uh, think uh, such a government should look at. One is why is the production costs of your farm are so much higher than the production costs of other farmers in other countries. Is it because fertilizers cost five times as much as they do in another country? Is it because the infrastructure is just not developed? Is it because the irrigation infrastructure isn't there, the roads aren't there, transportation costs are very high? Those are the things that need to be dealt with if in fact they are the constraining factors. The other part of it is the subsidies in other countries. Uh, this is not much of an issue right now, but when food prices were low, uh, there were huge subsidies um, given by some exporting countries, including this one, uh, including the United States, which was exporting food at highly subsidized prices. There was no way that a farmer in a developing country who didn't get subsidies could compete with that. So you got those two things to, to look at at least, but, but it is very context specific. and. I don't think we can sit in Washington to um, kind of design the solution. Hmm. Yeah, and just on the, I mean, I think the decentralization, centralization element is again <laughs> context specific. I mean, I think um, some of the implementation constraints that you have at national levels for implementation are magnified, you know, when you get to the subnational level uh, for decentralization. Yeah. So, um, and, and often trade policies in particular are not often decentralized. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're talking about a federal country like India that has, you know, a stronger decentralized system, that might be an option, but it, it's not a, an option in a lot of low-income countries. Uh, we have uh, about 10 minutes left for questions, uh, but I just wanted to put in a request um, that everyone fill out the surveys on your seats if you have a chance and decide to leave them on your seat or drop them on one of the entryway tables. They just help us uh, keep track of these events and improve those for next time. And uh, online, we'll have a, a survey as well. So we'll throw it back to online. And John Russell at Eco Food Systems in Oregon asks Are there any ways the international community can facilitate smallholder farmer organizations and LDCs to build the kind of political clout they have in countries like South Africa and Brazil? Uh, yes, if the small farmers could find a way of getting together and mobilizing the power that they would have as a group, uh, do I know exactly how to do that? No, I do not. Uh, but I think that's probably the only way they would ever have uh, a major say in how policies are designed and implemented. I think there's some examples in West Africa where farmers' organizations have been able to um, gain some type of political voice, um, particularly there's a CNCR in Senegal, which is what they've basically done is con created like like trade unions in the industrial sector created confederations of trade unions, so kind of, uh, you know, smallholders in different commodity sectors coming together on an umbrella organization. And then they have partners um, throughout much of West Africa. Um, so at the regional level, you have ROPA, um, which has had a pretty good policy influence within ECOWAS. So I think um, finding ways to, you know, facilitate different smallholders across commodities um, and across countries is, is one mechanism to, to get their voice heard. My name is Karen Edwards. I'm a consultant for the World Initiative for Soy and Human Health and uh, appreciated both of your comments and a lot of work went into that. I wondered if both of you could comment on where to next with your work. Um, will you be building on it? Will you be presenting it um, to policymakers, including in the United States? <laughs> first. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so this is kind of just... Um, uh, ongoing work and so over the next year we want to take this model and be testing it in different sets of case studies so we've kind of inductively derived it and now we want to see if it's 
if it's also valid, you know, externally valid um, on cases that we didn't <laughs> derive it from. Um, so I, I presented at the end the kind of three different policy domains that we're going to look at. Um, and our aim is to look at three country cases um, across each of those three domains. So hopefully nine country case studies um, um, in each of those domains. So for example, in Ghana, uh, for fertilizer subsidies, we're going to be looking at Ghana, Zambia, and Tanzania um, uh, because they've all had, had fertilizer subsidies, but they've chosen very different design features. Um, and some of them are reforming them entirely, some are not. Um, and so we have uh, then three countries for micronutrient and, and land tenure as well. Let me just two points. First, um, the researchers in the 14 developing countries that work with us in this network uh, are promoting the results from, from their work. Uh, we did have policymakers and past policymakers included in the teams in the various countries uh, in order to facilitate um, transmission of the results to the current policymakers. So there's a lot going on in those 14 countries, I believe. Um, we are also, uh, Finn and I are, are promoting the, the results in, in a number of, of fora. Uh, we're going to India shortly and, and wider, I believe, is going to continue to do much more um, uh, work in order to, to get these results in the hands of policy advisors and researchers. And Finn, did you want to add anything to your bench? Yeah, uh, Jeff Hill with uh, USAID uh, BFS there, and you know I think that you know you presented in fact a tremendous amount of different details um, and a lot of information about different options and the impacts of those options. You've taken on you know what you know really is I think a seminal issue with regard to the high food prices. You know there is a clear you know, understanding that that did change the world in many different ways as we've been thinking about, certainly from a development, you know, context. And I think that you've made, you know, a bit of a case that, in fact, it's critically important for understanding the policy systems and some of those different options. Um, and without that, a next wave that, you know, might be coming along is going to face uh, a considerable amount of both inconsistencies and, and inefficiencies. Um, but, you know, looking forward, right, my real question is, is that building upon, you know, this experience in the past, I mean, I'll putting it aside a little bit, you know, what are you actually, you looked at these different trends of the food prices, what should we be anticipating? What is actually going on with trends? You know, are we going to be actually, you know, seeing you know, future challenges, you know, what are some of those future challenges that we should be anticipating and worrying about building the policy systems to deal with? Uh, we are almost out of time, unfortunately, because that's a topic that we should be spending a lot more time talking about. Let me just mention, uh, mention a few things. In my crystal ball, the long-term trend in real deflated food prices is down. Not by much, but it's not up as some, as most uh, economists seem to be arguing. We're going to have huge fluctuations of similar to those we had in the past. We don't know when they're coming. We don't know how big they're going to be. What we do know is that we've been unable to do much about climate change. That is moving ahead and right along with it comes extreme weather events and right along with the extreme weather events come large fluctuations in food production and food prices and frequently adverse policy uh, interventions that cause even more uh, price fluctuations. So we, I, I think we're going to have to learn to live with price fluctuations. Uh, what worries me probably more than anything else right now is are we ready to deal with the impact of climate change, not just the uh, fluctuations in, in weather patterns, but also the long-term uh, green, uh, greenhouse gas increase and in the global warming. Uh, do we have the research underway that would help us deal with the new pests, the new uh, abiotic factors such as drought, uh, salt, uh, salt, um, uh, salt water, um, uh, flooding, and all of the things that come with climate change, which we don't uh, seem to be prepared to, to deal with. So we're going to have to adapt to that. That's one of the issues that I think we need to talk about. 
Uh, it is to a considerable extent linked to political economy, what we've been talking about today, because the, the various governments are going to respond in different ways and the various units within government will respond in different ways. Uh, and so there's a, there's a need for a lot more debate about how to deal with that. Uh, we can continue to stick our heads in the sand, uh, and, uh, but that won't stop climate change. We have exactly two minutes left, so I thought I'd squeeze in one last question um, before lunch, and I saw you with your hand raised. Okay, very quickly, working areas from AICA. I wonder if you find uh, in your, in your uh, countries uh, in, that you chose in the study problems in the information systems. I mean, in, very, in so many developing countries, the information systems are so poor that it takes so long to understand a problem and to see the implications of, of a problem. And also in many of these countries, there is no uh, uh, a system that integrates the whole policy, the whole process of policy development, no? The, the understanding the problem, designing the policy, following up on the policy, and also evaluating the policies. So, and we have to admit that it took very long to understand what, what, what's going on you know, with the food, uh, food uh, crisis. Well, that's why we didn't do these uh, country studies from uh, Helsinki or Cornell University. Um, they, these studies were done by people from the countries who lived in the countries. They were senior researchers. Presumably, they knew what was going on in the countries. It was a three-year study. You're absolutely correct. This is not something you jump into and do in a couple of weeks. Uh, but by having people who lived in the countries, who were nationals of the countries, who had studied these things before, uh, we thought that, uh, that we were safe. Uh, but we still needed three years to do it. You're absolutely correct. One of my regrets was that most of the participants were economists. We had very few political scientists. Uh, we simply could not find the, the, the highly qualified political scientists who had worked in this area. And we only wanted to include people in the network who had worked in, in the area before. Uh, we, uh, on country selection, we tried to select countries so that we could cover uh, different typologies, if you like. We had, uh, we had major exports, we had uh, exporters, we had major importers, we had landlocked countries, and so on. It's all de described in the material that's available. Um, but having said all of that, was the selection of countries totally scientific? No, of course not. It's a matter of where you have your contacts and so on. So, so there was a bit of, um, how do I put this, unscientific approach to this. But we did try to cover the spectrum. Finn, is that fair? I think that, sorry. Yes, I, I, I think that is fair. Um, but I also think it's fair to say that we did discuss a lot of different country typologies, okay. so that we have tried to address very different circumstances. If I may, there's just one last comment on, 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 on the question. Add that there is a lot in the country study to suggest that the export plan that Vietnam put on was purely due to lack of information of the central decision makers. So you will find in the volume, you will actually find a lot of those kinds of things that will help point to where is it that there's a need for more work to do as we move forward. And I think that's part of the thesis, as far as I'm concerned, that's part of the attraction of the volume. Thank you. Well, yeah, I would just add also on, I think, on information, that's actually a nice area where you can have more um, kind of cross-sectoral work between democracy and governance and, and maybe Bureau for Food Security because, uh, you know, one issue is just, you know, the media community within these countries not having the training um, um, to report on the complexity of some of these issues or being attracted to the really, you know, the quick you know, um, high profile issues um, and, and sometimes that influencing governments to respond quickly when a more kind of um, thoughtful, comprehensive reporting would be, would have been uh, more worthwhile. Um, and then secondly, I think, you know, on, on policy, um, policy making angle and particularly on, on adoption, I mean, a lot of these par parliaments in a lot of uh, the African countries that I work in, you know, only get the, the budgets, for example, um, you know, two weeks before they need to make a decision and they have maybe two people on a research a research team for parliament, you know, for um, committee, for food and agricultural committees. So I think there's some, you know, I think information is one of the, the areas where you can have a lot of kind of cross-sectoral work um, between democracy and governance and, and some of the development agencies.
Okay, well, let's give our speakers one more round of applause.